Today, we're going we're gonna to finish this series called Say What? Uh, with an understanding of another text that often is quoted out of context. Let me ask you a question this morning. How many of you, uh, if you had a little bit more money, life would be a little bit easier for you? Anybody? Okay, I'm, my hand's up. I mean, okay, I think that's a reasonable thing. You know, so often we think about uh, a text that we quote from the Bible, and we quote it like this. Money is the root of all evil, so I don't want anything to do with that. And we think about money is the root of all evil, and we think through that, and we say to ourselves, well, must be talking about somebody else. Well, well, really what Paul is writing when he talks about this comes out of 1 Timothy 6, and he actually says these words, for the love of money is the source of all kinds of evil. So most of us will read that and we'll say, great, he's talking about somebody else. It's not about me. I'm not a lover of money. Uh, I don't like worship it. No things. It's that other person he's talking about. I really don't have anything to worry about. Well, I think the question is begged this morning that asks the question, how do we know that we're not struggling with those very words? How do we know that somewhere along the line that maybe we're not lovers of money? We have to go to Solomon. Solomon was um, probably considered the wisest man that ever lived in the biblical sense. He was the son of David, the great king. And Solomon is a person who speaks a lot of wisdom. And, and I think today we live in a world where we really need more discernment, don't we? We need more wisdom. We need to talk to people that actually know about things and factually and those kind of things. And Solomon would be the kind of guy that we would want to pursue and say, tell us what you mean about this because you were all wise. And Solomon writes these words in Ecclesiastes. He says, if you, if you love money, you'll never be satisfied. So, so in other words, what he's saying is, there's a part where we'll believe that we'll never have enough. He says, if you long to be rich, you'll never get what you want. It's useless. He goes on to write in other places where, where he has everything that the world could possibly give to him, and yet he still couldn't find happiness. And I think that's really at the root of some of the struggles that we see in our life, that we are wondering about, will we ever have enough? Now, I realize um, that I set you up earlier when I asked you that question, how many of you feel with a little extra money that you would be better off? I, I realize that I set you up with that, and I did that for a reason, because I want us to know how close to a spiritual struggle that really is for us how we all, in some instances, long for those days where we have the security and all those things that money can offer, but yet we struggle with what's that position and how it deals with us. Many of us would say, if I just had a little bit more, if I just had a little bit more, if I just had a little bit more, then life would be a lot easier. Things would go a lot better. I'd be happier. I'd have a greater joy that comes in life. Well, before I uh, accepted my call into ministry, I was a businessman, and I was a businessman for, for a couple of decades, and, and what I recall back then was um, I'd come home from uh, work, and I'd say to Patty, you know what, I make this much, and the people I work with make this much, and can you imagine if I made what they made, we'd, we'd, how much more we'd be able to do? Any of you all ever think about that in some kind of context? I think it's normal to think that. And, and so we would think about, boy, if we just made what they made, then we would have more time for vac or more money for vacations. We could afford a bigger house. We could afford a newer car. We could start putting savings away for the kids to go to college. Then the day came when, when I actually earned what the other people made, and then that wasn't enough. And then I thought about that next level. But the boss, if I could only make what the boss makes... Then I could do, and I start thinking about all those kinds of things. And that's the struggle that comes so often for us, is that we put it in that kind of perspective. We put it in that kind of context. And we actually wrestle with the question, how much money do we really need to be happy? Um, how, do we need, how much do we need to be satisfied? How much do we need to feel secure? And that is a challenge and a struggle that we have. And I think everybody likely would answer those questions with, just a little bit more. So that's our focus today. Um, whoever loves money, Paul says, is somebody who's walking down a slippery slope. Whoever loves money and adores it, whoever uh, does those kind of things with the wealth that they have, Paul says, be very careful with what you do. I want to put this in proper context. We've been also talking about uh, whenever we read the Bible and we don't want to just like put our own interpretation on it, we want to make sure that we understand what's going on. I've been leading you through the last couple of weeks about how we read Scripture. Uh, if, if you're not accustomed to reading Scripture, take this as, a, as an opportunity to learn uh, and how to apply some things. So when you go home and read your Bible today or this week, you can uh, in, in, uh, implement some of these. First thing is to understand the context. What is it that's being said? 
What comes before what's written? What comes after? What's going on while this is being written? And what's the message that God wants us to know with that? That's called understanding the context. And I've said to you for the last couple of weeks, we never want to just cherry pick a verse in the Bible and build our whole theology based upon that. We actually want to know what's going on. The second thing I said in addition to context was that we need to look at where else in the Bible is that subject addressed? If it's of great importance, it's going to be addressed in multiple places. So we want to use Scripture with Scripture to find out where, indeed, that comes into play. The third thing I said is that we can't just read it and just say, okay, I've read it and I'm done. We can't just be hearers of the Word. We have to be, what? Doers of the Word. So not only do we read it, but we want to apply it, and we want to live it, and we want to make it uh, who we are. So if we take a look at this verse that I'm looking at in, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, um, we see a couple things happening. Who is Paul writing to? Paul is writing to a person named Timothy. Uh, Paul had no biological sons, but he had two sons that were his spiritual sons, Timothy and Titus. And the whole letters, he wrote two of them to Timothy that are in our scripture. He wrote one to Titus that's in our scripture. And what he writes to them about is he's writing to them about how to have a relationship with God what it means to love God, what it means to be obedient to God, what it means to serve God, what it means to share the love of God with others. And he says, I love you all like my biological sons. I want you to read this so that you'll know the answer to the questions of life and how to place God first. He goes on and he writes in verses 6 and 7, religion does make, does make a person very rich if he is satisfied with what he has. But what did we bring into the world? What does he say we brought into the world? Nothing. What do we take out of the world? What does he say? Nothing. So Paul says godliness and contentment is what brings great gain. It's, it's something that we need to not just understand with our heads, but we need to understand it with our hearts. So often our heads and our hearts are, are on opposite pages. Our head says one thing, our heart says another. So we have to be united as to what that means. Paul says we must be content and that we don't take anything from the world because we came into the world with nothing. I mean, how often do we see a hearse pulling a U-Haul, or excuse me, a rider trailer? How long do we see that, a hearse pulling a rider trailer? You know, we don't take it with us. When we die, everything is left here. There's a, a man who said to his wife, he said, the doctor has told me I have two weeks to live, so I'm going to get my affairs in order. And he says, I'm going to take everything that I own and put it into money into paper money. So he cashes in every bit of his net worth. He gets it all in cash, and he puts it in a huge travel trunk. And he takes a travel trunk, and he puts it up in the attic, and he tells his wife, when I die and I'm going up to heaven, I'm going to grab that and go right up there with it. It's going to be with me. So his wife was like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Well, a couple weeks later, he did die. And she goes up in the attic, and there's the travel trunk. And she opens it up, and it's full of his cash, his whole net worth. And she said, that silly fool, I told him he should have put it down in the basement so that way he could just take it with him where he went. You know, money and, and the love, I should say the love of money um, is a huge, huge draw for us and it's something that we have to get right. Paul says we brought nothing in the world, we take nothing with us. He goes on to write verse 8. I find this really intriguing. He says, if you have food and clothes, that should be enough for you. Now, can you imagine that? Okay, if we had food and clothes, but this is probably what we would say. If I had food and clothes and my cell phone, I'd be happy. If I had food and clothes, my cell phone, oh, and the 65-inch TV. If I had my food, my clothes, my cell phone, my 65-inch TV, oh, and Netflix. If I had all of those things, then I'd be happy. And that's kind of where we're at in the struggles that we see and the challenges that come before us. And Paul is trying to teach us that, that so often we get this wrong and we think just because someone is wealthy, they're happy. And he says there are plenty of examples that show that sometimes the richest people aren't the happiest people. And it's sometimes it's the poorest people who have the greatest attitude, or who, are, who feel that life is of its greatest importance. And this comes to light whenever you go to an economically depressed area, or if you go to a third world nation, and you begin to look at people who have nothing. We get off of the airplanes, we pay for the high-priced vacations, uh, you know, we're from America, right? And we go into, the, into these places, and we begin to see people who have nothing, 
but yet they're joyful, they're happy, they're excited, and we're thinking about, oh, that other deal that I still have to close, or, or how am I going to get some more of this or some more of that, or, or gosh, you know, when I get back, I still have to buy that other thing that I need to do. Our priorities are not the same. We're challenged by that. And that's the struggle that we see so often that comes in our lives. It's unsettling, isn't it? It's unnerving to know that there are Christians who actually live in places that have nothing that find themselves so happy. And yet we who have everything as Christians, we look at that and we go like, we don't understand it. But you don't have all of what we have. But you're happy? Paul writes about the church in Macedonia and he says they were poorer than poor. Uh, he said they were po. They were poorer than poor. They were po. They had nothing. And yet they were joyful and they gave of themselves so greatly into the love and the service of God. You know, they have depth. They have peace. And having riches isn't measured by who has the most. Sometimes the richest people are those who have the least. Paul goes on to write, he, he says, but those who want to be rich, uh, anybody ever heard of Powerball? If you want to be rich, Powerball. They fall into temptation and they're caught in the trap of many foolish and harmful desires which pull them down into ruin and destruction. Now you don't have to raise your hand, but let me just ask a rhetorical question. How many of us in the room know somebody who was in a fight with a family member or a friend over money? And how that destroyed the relationship between family members or friendships because of money. How many businesses have been destroyed based upon arguments over money? Partnerships dissolved, marriages collapsed. So we see what Paul is saying is so true because so often we want to chase after something and make that be our life's focus when it shouldn't be. So the love of money, he says, the love of money is the root of all evil. But when we hear that, we also have to be careful that we don't hear or that we don't buy into that money is bad. Folks, money isn't bad. Those who have money are not bad people. Those who have little or those who have lots are good people. Don't worship the, the, the money that you have. That's the key. Because that is what brings us into the love of God. To love, to serve God, we have to get that right. Because Jesus said we cannot both love God and love money. We can't both serve God and serve money. Those are the pieces that he brought into us. Now, in many parts of the church, there are, there are two different gospels that are usually taught. There's what's called the prosperity gospel and what's called the poverty gospel. The prosperity gospel goes something like this. If you give all of this to God, then God is obligated to give it back to you in more abundance, that you will be over, over and fist with the monies that come back. The prosperity gospel teaches that if you have $3 to your name and you give it all to God, that tomorrow morning you're going to have a Rolls Royce and you're going to have a mansion in the Bahamas and you're going to have all those things. We need to be very careful and we need to be very uh, sharp when we're trying to teach messages like that because that's not what the gospel says. The poverty gospel, the flip side, teaches this. And, and people that live in the poverty gospel, they say that if you have any wealth at all, if you have any wealth at all, then, then you can't be holy, that you can't be a lover of God. So therefore, you have to sell and get rid of everything. So the poverty gospel takes it to the other extreme, and that's not true either. So we have to find the balance of what is there and what is really going on. Uh, what does the Bible say about it? It, it, it says that, that we have to remember that it is the Lord God who gives us the power to become rich. And I'll explain what that term means in a second. He does this because he is still faithful today to the covenant that he made to his ancestors. So what does God do? He gives us the power to be rich. Translated, God gives us the power to earn a living. That's what rich translates in Greek, to earn a living. So what we have, God has given us the power to acquire that. So if, what, if God has given us the power, then God will never give us evil. The question is, how are we using the gift of which God has given us? Do you see the point I'm trying to make? So as we live into that, there comes with that a huge level of responsibility of the things that we are called to see. So we need to understand that everything that we have, God has given to us, and that we are to use the wealth that God gives us for the furthering of the kingdom's purpose into the, in, in the world of what we see. Therefore, we can have wealth, 
but we are not to love our wealth. We can have money, but we are not to love money. There's a big distinction of where it is. Now, verse 17, uh, Paul gets into our business a little bit. Listen to what he writes here. Tell people who are rich at this time not to become egotistical and not to place their hope on their finances, which are uncertain. Anybody else in 2008 lose half of their 401k besides me? Yeah, so we cannot put our hope in what riches say in our finances because they're uncertain. Instead, they need to hope in God who richly provides everything for our enjoyment. For years, I would read that text and I would say, Paul is talking about the guys that live in the gated community. Paul's talking about the people with four-bedroom homes. Paul is talking to people that, that have multiple cars. Paul is talking to people about people who take vacations. Paul, I mean, for years, that's what I thought. Nowhere did I ever think that he was talking about me. It was always somebody else that he is railing on here. But then I started looking at it in a more global context, which is how we need to read Scripture. Let me ask you this question. In your purse or in your pocket is hundreds of dollars of technology. It's called a cell phone, right? Most of us in the room have one. Did you know the price that you paid for your cell phone equates to more wages on an annual basis than two-thirds of the people that work a year that live on our planet? Did you know that? Your cell phone, my cell phone. We're wealthy. Did you know that if you drive a car, how many in the room drive a car? How many have more than one car? I do, okay. Did you know that 9% of the world's population has automobiles? 91% does not. So if you have a car, you are in the top 10% of the wealthiest in our world economy right now. Folks, don't ever think that he's not talking about us. Don't ever think that he's just talking about the person in the big house or the person who uh, has the big job or the big salary or whatever. He's talking about us. Because if you look at it, uh, what we have uh, comes to amount to what wealth really is. And let me tell you how crazy this can become. Uh, one night this week, you're going to get in the car and you're going to go out to dinner. Maybe it's the weekend, maybe it's a weeknight, I don't know. But you're going to go out to dinner. You're going to get in the car and you're going to drive and you're going to drive and you're going to drive. Maybe you're going to drive 15 minutes, maybe you're going to drive 20 minutes. Some of you might drive an hour to get to the restaurant that you really want to go to. When you finally get there, what are you going to do? You're going to pay somebody to park your car because you really don't want to walk that far from where you park to get to where you're going to go eat. So you pay a valet. You're going to go inside, you're going to sit down at the table, and they're going to bring you a menu, and you're going to look at all these items of this wonderful food, these wonderful uh, delectable selections that are in the menu. You're going to look at them all, look at it and try to make your choice. When you finally settle on, this is what I want, you're going to say to somebody who makes below minimum wage, you're going to tell them what you want to eat, and they're going to go take it back into the kitchen, and then you're going to get angry because it took longer than 11 minutes to bring your dinner out to you at your table. You're gonna eat your meal very quickly, you're gonna go back, you're gonna get back in your car, you're gonna drive home, and you're gonna put your car in its own house. It's called a garage. Your car has a house. Our cars are weather resistant. We protect them from bad weather. We put them in garages. We're gonna go in our homes that are climate controlled. We're gonna go and we're gonna punch the heat up because it's too cold, or we're going to punch the, air, uh, the AC up because it's too hot. Then we're going to go inside, we're going to grab a, bottle, uh, a, 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 a box of popcorn or a, or a bowl of ice cream, and we're going to sit and watch our 90-inch flat-screen TV. We're going to watch the Rays play, or we're going to watch some movie, and we're going to just sit there for hours. And then we're going to get up, and we're going to go put on our nice pajamas, and we're going to go crawl into our big fluffy beds with probably 1,000-count Egyptian cotton sheets, and we're going to sleep all night like we've never slept before. We're gonna get up the next morning and we're gonna walk in, we're gonna take a hot shower. Believe it or not, we've got hot water. We're gonna take a hot bath with soap. And then we're gonna walk into our closet with our towels or our robes around us. Did you hear me walk into your closet? Some of us have walk-in closets. And we're gonna walk inside and we're gonna look at the towers of clothes. So they're like two-level condos. There's the lower shelves of clothes and then there's the upper shelves of clothes. And we're going to start at one end, and we're going to start thumbing through all the clothes that we see. And we're going to be, hmm, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And we're going to get to the very end, and then we're going to sit there with a perplexed look on our face, and guess what we're going to say? I have nothing to wear. Right? Folks, we're rich. This isn't just the people and the big houses. Paul is saying all of us 
If you live in America, you're rich. What, regardless of where you are on the income scale, comparatively to the world standards, we are rich people. So I want to read verse 17 again, but I want us now to put all of that in context. Tell the people who are rich at this time, who's he talking to? He's talking to you and me. He's saying, don't be egotistical, which means that we should never be arrogant about what we have, to not place our hope on our, in our finances, that we are not to put our hope solely in money because it's uncertain. Instead, they, you and me, we need to hope in God who richly provides for our enjoyment. You see, why do we tend to put our hope in our wealth? Because money promises what only God can deliver. Money says, I'm going to give you happiness. I'm going to give you security. I'm going to give you hope. I'm going to give you all these things. I'm going to make you feel better. It's going to lift your esteem. But at the end of the day, it can't, it can't deliver that. It's only a short fuse. But let me tell you, you know what? We, we struggle with these things. And sometimes what we say is, if I only had the, the credit cards paid off, then we could do this. Or, wow, I can't imagine. When we finally have the mortgage paid off, then we can do this. Or, or hey, those student loans, they're really strapping me right now. Man, when I have an extra $500 a month because I paid those off, just think what I can do. We're always battling that. Because money promises the things that only God can deliver. You know, here's another one. You know, uh, money also promises that we can be somebody. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Some of us in the room and some of us in life, we're just so down on ourselves that we don't like who we are or what we look like or, you know, we're just, our esteem is so low. So we use money to build ourselves up. We go down and we buy expensive clothes and we wear them. We get expensive accessories. I remember for years, I used to drive up to people's houses in my old beater and I'd turn it off and it would like, boom, 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 backfire. So, oh, the pastor's here. You know, and then, uh, you know, so some of us have lived through those days, but now all of a sudden we want to be something. So we build ourselves up and we buy into this thing to be more than what God created us. You don't have to do that. Money can't deliver that. Guys, you're royalty. You're sons and daughters of a king. And we've got to remember that because God created us in, our, in his own image, that we are of value, we are of hope, that we don't need any of those things that so often we buy into the trappings of that. So whenever we think that we need money to be happy and money to be secure and money to have significance, we are under the powerful influence of what money will do. But money can never meet our deepest needs. What are our deepest needs? They're Jesus Christ. More money won't keep your kids off drugs. More money won't make your spouse love you more. More money won't make your life more secure. Only Jesus can do that. And here's the crazy thing. When you, when you don't have a lot of Jesus in your heart, when you don't have a lot of Jesus in your life, guess what? All you're doing is, is spending the money and worshiping the money and trying to get ahead. But when you have Jesus in your life, having to buy all those things that you put in the garage sale a year later isn't important anymore. It's about having that relationship and I'm telling you today that a lot of us have been searching. We've been searching for that hope. We've been searching for that answer. We've been trying to find it in money. And the hope and happiness and security and all those things will never come in what money has. It only promises that. But Christ is the one who delivers. What do we need? We need more Jesus. We need more of his grace. We need more of his assurance. We need more of his presence. We need more power, his power in our life. Why? Because he's our sustainer. He's our bread of life. He is our Alpha, our Omega, the beginning and the end. He is our rock. He is our refuge. He is our ever-present help in time of need. Jesus Christ is our assurance. And that's where we need to be. And whenever we see that, and whenever we believe that and understand that, then we begin to see a difference in life. And then we begin to have our priorities put into place. But with that comes a responsibility. The scripture says that everything we have has been given to us by God. Some would argue, but I only have this much and they have this much. Everything you have, wherever it is, however much, has been given to you by God. And the question is, what are you doing with it? How are you, how are you living with it? How are you living through it? I can't tell all of you what your spiritual journey has been when it comes to the Bible teachings and spirituality and money, but I can tell you my story. And I can tell you that this was something that Patty and I struggled with early on in the years of our marriage. 
I wasn't a pastor then, and, but we were church folk. We went to church. I taught an adult class. She was a part of a, a women's group. I played on the church softball team. We were in worship every Sunday. But when it came to giving back to God's work, we, we, we missed the mark. We thought we were doing the right thing. We're serving, we're serving, we're serving. But when it came to that surrender piece, we missed the mark. We had lots of conversations about that. And we began to really wrestle with that because we said in order for us to, to uh, honor God with a gift, a financial gift, then that means we have to take away something that we want. We can't go buy that thing or we can't go to the game this weekend or we can't go out to the restaurant three times on Saturday. And we began to really struggle with that. And I remember we had some really hard conversations about that. I remember the day finally came where we both said, okay, we're going to do this. Now the Bible says that that the way that we deal with this is that we know that God has given us everything that we have. And the Bible teaches in the Old and the New Testament that there's a way to honor God back with us called a tithe. And a tithe is 10% of what God has given you. So God gives you 100%, you give God back 10%, you keep 90%. You see how that works with that. And, and what God says with that is, is that that's, that's the check and balance to ensure that you're not loving and making money your God because you are sacrificially giving back to him. And so we struggled with that. And finally, the day came and we said, okay, this week, we're going to take 10% of everything we've earned this week in our paychecks and we're going to write a check back to God's work in the life of the church. And I got to tell you, I didn't sleep a wink that night before I put it in. I started the whole what if, whatever, whatever, but we did that. And then what we began to see was later on when I answered a call into ministry and, and sacrificial giving became a part of our life over and above the tithe, then we began to see that God had destroyed that negativism in us. The way that you defeat loving money is to become joyful in giving back to God. There are lots of organizations around the world that do great things. There is only one organization that God says, that is my presence on earth, and that's the church. And so what we see is when God blesses us, we give back to God's work through the life of the church. And ever since we've been in public ministry for 24 years now, we've not only tithed, but we've given sacrificially. And I don't tell you that so that you think more about me. The reason I tell you that is because I want you to know I live the gospel that I preach. And I want you to know that. And, and it's about pulling priorities together. So we see the significance about what comes with that. Now, some of you are probably saying, Pastor, we never took up the offering this morning. Did you forget? No, I didn't. Let me tell you why. When I write a message, and I know when Pastor Pam writes a message, we're very prayerful, and we always ask for the Holy Spirit's guidance in the words in which we write and the actions in which we take. And I can tell you without fail that the Holy Spirit said to me this week, don't take up the offering until after the people have heard the message that God wants us to hear today. Some of you come to church and you have pre-written checks. That's great. I love that. I'm, I'm glad of your faithfulness and the things that you do. But what I want to encourage you today is I want you to encourage you to think about the words we talked about. How can you become sacrificial? How can you become a lover of God? How can you uh, give back to God a huge portion of that? You know, churches oftentimes find themselves in financial challenges. I attended a conference not long ago of the 25 largest United Methodist churches in the Florida Annual Conference. We're one of those here at St. Paul. Our bishop was a part of the conversation. And as I sat around the table with 24 other large church pastors in our conference, the number one thing that they all said that their church struggles with is, what do you think? It's money. Why do you think Jesus taught so much about it? because it's something we've got to get right. So I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to, to develop a heart of generosity, not just today, but from this day forward. I want to encourage you to trust God. I want to encourage you to know how blessed you really are. I want to encourage you to fulfill his mandate that the church be the beacon of light to the people around the world. And through your help, through all that you do, that is made possible. Here's the last thing that Paul said. He said, tell them to do good, to be rich in the good things that they do, to be generous and to share with others. And when they do these things, they will save a treasure for themselves that is a good foundation for the future. And that way, they can take hold of what is truly life. 
let us be generous in all that we do.